Right. So good afternoon. Thank you, Brother Jojo. Um, so it's good to see all of you. I just want to know, who among you here, you were here last Sunday? Last Sunday? For the Easter celebration. Yeah? You know, sometimes we, we listen to messages every Sunday that we forget that the message last Sunday, which is the resurrection of Christ, is the most important. Right? So let's not forget that. And maybe I'll just give a little summary later on. So I'm excited with all the things that uh, God is doing in our church um, regarding uh, Auckland South. And, uh, yeah, well, you know, let's praise God for that, you know? And, um, yeah, so we're also setting up some D groups in Hamilton, and we do have one D group in Waitomo. We are also doing some uh, Skypeship or online discipleship uh, with some people in Christ Church and in Queenstown right now. So we are praying for, for those areas, and we're praying that God will expand our borders. Okay, so just another announcement. Don't forget, for the music team, you have a, a general assembly on next Sunday after the service. And there will be some, yeah, downstairs, okay? So that's after the service. Okay, yeah, you know, I was thinking, sometimes every Sunday we hear a message, but I just want to remind you that the most important message is the resurrection of Christ. And that's why, you know why? It, because truth matters, correct? That's our series, Truth Matters. Everyone say, Truth Matters. And we talked about experiencing the true gospel, and it's about the resurrection last week. You know why it's so important? If the resurrection did not happen, then you know what? Forget Christianity. Seriously, if it did not happen, forget Christianity, because it would mean that we are worshiping someone who did not keep his promises. Plus, we trusted someone who deceived us because Jesus, while he was still alive, said that he will resurrect from the dead. So if it did not happen, that Jesus was the greatest uh, deceiver of all time. But you know what? It did happen. And there are enough evidence that proves it, right? Even during that time. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, it says, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. So because there are so many witnesses, if someone tries to refute it, no. They're going to say, no, there's enough witnesses around that proves that Jesus was alive and resurrected during that time. See, people will try to refute it, but enough evidence was there during that time. So it cannot be refuted. Therefore, if indeed Jesus resurrected from the dead, what does it mean to us? What does it mean to us? Well, first, we must declare him as Lord and God. He cannot be simply considered as a great teacher, correct? Because he's declaring himself as God. He says that I can resurrect from the dead. So you cannot just say he's a good teacher. He's a good prophet. We must declare him as Lord and God. In verse 36, it says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. All right? So you can be assured of that. Another, in Acts chapter 2 as well, verse 37, you've got to make a choice. We have to make a choice. You cannot just say, okay, so Jesus resurrected from the dead, and then that's it. This is a fact that, has, that demands a choice from every person who is alive. When the people heard this in verse 37, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? If the resurrection is false, forget Christianity. Forget going here on Sundays. Let's just go somewhere else. But if it is true, it demands that we have to make a choice. We cannot remain the same. For these people who heard the first sermon after the resurrection, they said they were cut to the heart. They were so impacted. In the next verse, it must lead to a transformed life. You cannot remain the same if the resurrection truly happened and you make the right choice. In verse 38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it demands an action. It says here you have to repent. What does repent mean? Repent means a change of mind, and you turn away. So it's not a change of simple behavior. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. That is repentance. If you say, yeah, I'm just wrong, but you don't change, 
That's not repentance. That is simply remorse. Do you understand? There's a difference between remorse and repentance. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. And then there was baptism. And baptism is the evidence of your salvation, that you indeed are now following Christ. And therefore, I want to show to the world through the symbolism of baptism. And then you receive empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So if, you re if indeed Christ resurrected, you have to make a choice. And when you make the choice to surrender your life to Christ, it has to change you. If you remain the same, then I really doubt if you truly have Christ in your heart because the, the Holy Spirit has supernatural power to transform us. If your life is not changing, then maybe you do not have the Holy Spirit. Now, has, you, has your life changed ever since you received Christ into your heart? I'm very convinced. <laughs> okay. okay. Has it changed? Yes. Yeah, for me, the first change in my life when I received Jesus Christ was the change of my words and my mouth. There was a time that I would speak bad words, say bad words at the start of a sentence, at the end of a sentence, and in the middle of a sentence. Have you experienced that? Mm. Yeah, all right, I'm sure you did, all right? Well, for these people, okay, in verse 41, this is what happened. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. How many? So how big was the first church? Okay, how, was, how big was the first church? About 3,000, right? So the first church was actually already a mega church. Do you understand? All right? So that's the idea. My question is, so that's how they responded to the message of the resurrection. They were cut to the heart. How about you? How have you responded? Have you really been cut to the heart? If yes, now I ask, what do we do next? Right? Because that's the beginning of the church. The book of Acts is about the beginning of the church, not the end of the church. So what happens next? And that's why we're going to go through most of the book of Acts. Okay? Acts has about 28 chapters, so maybe you know, we'll finish in 10 years. But we will still talk about it, right? So have you responded next? And that's what we're going to talk about. We need to respond properly. So as we go there, I want to ask, do you have weird habits in your life? You have weird habits. Like, I remember I have a classmate. His weird habit was he kept on biting his nails all the way until it's gone. And, you know, all the. Who bites their nails? Okay, that's your habit. You bite your nails. Okay, do you have other weird habits? Okay, what's your weird habit? Well, I don't think I want to ask you right now, right? But you know what? Have you, have you seen this? Um, do you know this brand of toothpaste? Do you know this brand of toothpaste? Okay. You know what? In the 1900s, in the 1900s, okay, Americans did not have the habit of brushing their teeth. Okay, they do not have. Okay, as a matter of fact, one estimate says that only 7% of the population brush their teeth. This was in the early 1900s. Okay? So, because of that, a lot of tooth decay, a lot of cavities, and a lot of false teeth. Now, what happened was they hired, a, they hired a marketing expert and they asked them, let's try to make Pepsodent into a very popular toothpaste. So this guy did some research and he, the goal was to build the habit of brushing their teeth. So through marketing, they, they came up with, um, with a taste that is kind of minty. So after you brush your teeth, you have that feeling of a cool, tingly, minty feeling after you brush. And it felt clean. So now, after you eat a lot of, I don't know, lechon and you know, all these things, you don't feel that your teeth are clean and you're missing that craving of having that minty feeling. And it reminds you to do the habit of brushing your teeth and using Pepsodent. Do you understand? So for me, I am so amazed because I'm a marketing guy, right? From 7%, within 10 years of this campaign, marketing campaign, that the whole population from 
it now became 65% brushing their teeth. Okay, that's, that's, that's something amazing in the marketing world, right? Now, I hope in this congregation, there's more than 65% of you brushing their teeth. Amen? Amen. Raise of hands who have it. No, 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 no. Raise your hands, okay? Me. Okay, don't do that. Okay? So you know what? Those are habits. And the first church also had habits for them to grow. And the benefits are far better than simply avoiding tooth decay. In verse, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, we'll be in Acts chapter 2. The word devoted there is from the Greek word proskaterio. Okay, proskaterio. Prokasterio. Pro, pro okay, it comes from the two words pros and kartereo. Pros means moving forward. Moving towards. And carter, cartereo means steadfast, endure, and persevering. So you're moving forward and you're enduring. What does this mean? When they said that they were devoted to these habits, they kept practicing these activities regularly. It's being intentional. They made time for it. It was a priority and not simply an afterthought that, oh, okay, maybe I should do that. No, it was really planned. You see, in our spiritual walk, sometimes instead of being intentional, we just hope that we will grow in our spiritual walk. There's no plan. You just wish. But that cannot be. Some, us, some of us also, we're just satisfied. Okay, let's just go to church on Sundays, not commit the big sins, be good to other people. But you know what? If the Holy Spirit is in you, then there's more to this life than simply that. Because you have the Holy Spirit to empower you to live a life that is extraordinary. Many times I admire Christians who just speak so well, they have a lot of Bible knowledge, and they communicate God's Word really well. It seemed so natural, and perhaps, yes, they are gifted with some communication gifts and talents. But when I look deeper, behind the seemingly natural giftings of their speaking skills, there was a lot of preparation that went on. There was a lot of prayer, and there were a lot of habits that they were developing all, the, all those years in order to grow in their relationship with God and in their way of speaking. You know, for Pastor Peter, our senior pastor, we can call him Dr. Okay, Dr. Peter Tanchi. Why? Because all these years, he will not just, you know, he will not just quit the ministry and go full time in terms of studying. But every semester, he will take one paper, another paper, another paper, just a little at a time, because he wants to develop that habit of continuously improving and continuously growing in his relationship with God and knowledge of the Bible. So, because of that, later on, because he finished all these papers, he can now be considered a doctor. You see, that's the same way. These little habits that we do today, it will later on add up. Reading the Bible, reading God's Word today, it all adds up. It doesn't become automatic. In the same way, when it comes to, to, to holiness, you don't just wish you become holy. Okay? There are habits that you have to take. You have to make some boundaries in your life in order to protect your heart so that it doesn't get swayed away to follow the, the laws of this world. We, have, we need to come up with these habits. That's why we want to talk about this. Practice the habits of a spirit-filled church. Okay? Can we say that? Practice the habits of a spirit-filled church. So the world will be attracted to Christ. All right? So, what are these habits? Well, I hope you can guess some of them, but I will teach you seven. So, are you ready? Okay, can you look at your seatmate? Can you check them? Are they ready? Okay, are you ready? Okay, good. So, let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Well, the first is, it's the study of Scripture. Study of Scripture, that's the first. It says there in verse 42, again, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Who are they? Who's they there, by the way? Who's they? Okay, the first church, right? How many were there in the first church? About 3,000. So the first church was mega, okay? 
So, you know, some people, they prefer big, big churches, small churches. It's not about the size of the church. What's important is that church has these habits so that people will grow, right? So now in the apostles' teaching, what is this? The apostles' teaching were they were teaching the Old Testament and they were talking to them about what they learned from Jesus and they're just passing it on, okay? Now, we call this sola scriptura, okay? What's sola scriptura? Do you know? Okay, sola means alone. Okay, so sola scriptura means scripture alone. And that means scripture alone is the authoritative basis for Christian faith and practice. The Bible is complete, reliable, and true. Now, why is this very important? When people, when groups, when churches start adding stuff to the Bible, it's a spiral down way of diluting the reliability of all this, of their beliefs. Okay? Some people, they have extra books. Some groups, they have extra books and writings. Their founders, their heads, and some of some of these churches, they have their own books. They said that they received special revelation from God and from Jesus Christ. They write it down. And those books that they added are equal to the Bible. You understand? And when that happens, even if it contradicts the Bible, they will now start believing. These are important because this is what the founders said, okay, what the heads of our organization said are coming from God. And now those, those teachings are now equal to the Bible. Another problem is some groups, some churches, they add traditions. Nothing wrong with traditions. But suddenly, because of traditions, it, even if it is already contrary to the Bible, they will still follow traditions because that's what everyone believed in ever since. Okay? And then there are other writers and other teachings. And it, what happens is their teachings are now equal to the Bible. Some are more concerned with, uh, with the systems of theology that these writers and theologians uh, written down than what the Bible says already. They are now followers of the writers and theologians rather than the Bible. So we have to be very careful. Now the question is, are you devoted to God's word? Pros, procas, procasterio, devoted. You're intentional about it. Okay? You don't just wish that, ah, okay, maybe I have time today, I'll read the Bible. That you will never develop a habit that way. Okay? Now I ask you, how many days in a week did you miss brushing your teeth? Aside from Sunday, what other days do you miss brushing your teeth? Okay. Now, I ask you, how many days this week did you miss reading the Bible? How many, if you compare that, which had more days where you missed? Brushing your teeth or the Bible? You know, those are just simple things that I want you to, to think about. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. What does he say? All. What does all mean? All, right? Meaning, when I read Genesis and the creation, when I read Exodus, when I read about the laws, when I read about Joshua, when I read the Psalms, the Proverbs, it's, when I read about the wars, when I read about the curses, when I read about the blessings, when I read about the promises, all of it is God-breathed. God-breathed means inspired, perfect, fully reliable, and it's to guide everyone to the right path. Right? So I encourage you, because it is only God's Word that's perfect, use Scripture not simply your desires to make decisions in life. Okay? I remember, um, it was just shared to me, there's this woman, and she, she told the pastor okay, of uh, CCF, Pastor, I'm pretty sure God's will for me is to marry that man. Okay? So the pastor listened. And then the girl said, there's only one problem. The man is married. But she's sure that God is leading her to marry this man. Do you understand? 
you know, sometimes it's our desires. It's no longer based on what the Bible says. You know what? If I'm going to tell you not to pray, do not pray anymore to God for something that's explicitly already said in the Bible. Like, do not steal. You do not pray, Lord, should I, should I steal that? Should I cheat in my exam? You don't pray that, right? Should I commit adultery? Of course, you don't pray that anymore because that is already explicitly said in the Bible. If you are praying those prayers, then maybe you are looking for a way to compromise. You are looking for a way that maybe I am an exception to this law of God. No, right? So do not pray those prayers that God is already explicitly saying in God's word. Now, my question when it comes to studying scripture, do you crave for it? Do you crave the nourishment that the Bible gives you? Now, just like a baby, okay, just like a baby, how many here you have children below two years old? Raise your hand. You have children below two years old. Yeah? They're all in the baby's room. Okay? <laughs> I dare. <laughs> okay? So, you know what? The baby will naturally crave physical milk. Now, if a baby does not crave milk, oh, by the way, how do the babies tell us that they're hungry? They cry, right? Because they desire milk. Now, there are only two, way, two, two reasons that a baby will not cry for milk. First is, if they, don't, if they don't crave milk, then maybe the baby is dead, right? Because a baby will naturally crave for nourishment. And spiritually, if you do not have craving for the Bible, then maybe you're spiritually dead. Because there has to be a craving to nourish your soul. Now, another reason that perhaps a baby will not crave milk is that the baby is sick. If a baby is sick, you lose appetite, correct? Now, maybe the reason why you are not craving God's word is because there is a sin in your life that is making you lose appetite for God's word. In Psalm 119 verse 47, it says, for I delight in your commands because I love them. You see, if you really love God, you're going to love His Word. You know, I remember I was uh, talking to someone. Okay, she's an optometrist. So she has many patients okay, in, 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 um, in an optical shop. And she was sharing to me, you know what? Well, I was, was I a pastor then? I don't remember, a long time ago. You know what, Ryan? There's this patient. He's really my crush. Okay, all right, so here's go, here goes counseling. And you know what? He wrote me a letter about five years ago just thanking me for being such a nice optometrist. Yeah, And I've kept that letter all these years. I said, wow, the, he, she really treasures that letter. And I told her, okay, um, can I see the letter sometime? And then she said, yeah, sure, it's here. I brought it. Okay? She brings it in her bag every day. Okay, like, okay, I think that's idolatry. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, you know, if you crave God's word, you would want to read it. If you're spiritually alive, you want to crave, you want to desire God's word. If not, then maybe you're spiritually dead or you're spiritually sick and you're compromising somewhere. It is my prayer that you will be able to say this in the same way the psalmist said, I delight, I delight in your commands because I love them. You love God so much. You love his word and you love to obey them, right? So study of scripture. I ask you, are you devoted to God's word every day? I encourage you every day. Don't just depend on a Sunday. Yeah, it's like Sunday, okay, I'll have a buffet and then the rest of the week you're, you're starving and you're fasting, that's what happens spiritually. You're trying to get all your nourishment on Sunday, and then for the rest of the week, you're starving yourself. That's not how it is. I cannot be the one to feed you every day. You have to learn to feed yourself spiritually as I speak. Okay? So next is, next is fellowship in small groups. Again, in Acts verse, chapter 2, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to 
fellowship. And the word fellowship is from the word koinonia. Okay? And it's sharing something in common, coming together, encouraging one another. So this is more than just socials. Okay? There's eating and coming together now. This one, I think we're an expert in this because a lot of you, I know you love to eat. Right? You love to eat. So that's great. And you know what? While eating, what do you talk about while eating? You're talking about how the food was made and you're also talking of other kinds of food, correct? That's what it is. But you know what? If we come together and it's simply eating, then that's just socials. But the word fellowship is that you're encouraging one another. In verse 46, it says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. Okay, so two settings. One is temple courts. That's the large group. And then there are meeting in house to house in small groups. And you know what? CCF did not invent small groups. You can see that in the book of Acts. And how often do they do it? What does it say here? Every day. Okay? Now, anyone here, you, you have a D group every day? Okay? No, right? But here, every day. And the, here's the thing. When it comes to large group meetings and small group meetings, shouldn't you be convicted that for them, every day they meet up, while for some of us, we cannot even commit to a weekly service or a fortnight D group? How do you expect to grow? But not only that, when you're part of a D group, it's not simply, oh, what, you know, what, feed me, feed me, feed me. What can I learn from this? It's also about you blessing the people in your group. And the truth is, there are many verses in the Bible that you cannot really apply or it will be very difficult to apply if you are not in a small group setting. Okay? Have you heard of the verses that had one another's? The love one another, serve one another. Do you understand? There are about 47 one another verses in the Bible. 47. There's a verse of, there are 15 verses on, related to unity. There are 15 verses on love. Seven verses on humility. And another 10 that are miscellaneous. All one another's. And these are commands, right? So let me show you some examples. Encourage one another, love one another, serve one another, be devoted to one another, admonishing one another, restore such one in a spirit of gentleness. So you, you rebuke and you restore one another. It is impossible to do that if you are not in a small group setting. You cannot do this. This is very difficult to do in a large group setting. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 to 25, it says, And let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Okay? So in a small group, you're always thinking, how can I encourage the others? Okay? Instead of, oh, they have to encourage me. If not, maybe I should just look for another D group. I'm not encouraged here. You know what? Small groups help address selfishness. Because selfishness is like, okay, what can I get out of this? But when you're in a small group, you have to have a mindset, just like in Hebrews, you're thinking, how can I encourage the people here to become more loving and to serve God even more? Okay? So, you know, it's in a small group setting that you grow and you learn from one another. I still remember, okay? So this was about maybe 1990. Okay, but the first Bible study I taught was in a small group setting. And my first Bible study lesson was who you are in Christ. And I still remember it. And it was through a small group setting. So you see, the D group uses others to bless you. At the same time, the D group uses you to bless others. So we are here to bless one another. Can you tell the person beside you, I want to be a blessing to you? Yeah, come on, mean it. I want to be a blessing to you. Now, here's the thing when it comes to meeting up. When you start giving one excuse or one justifiable reason why you do not go to a small group meeting, be very careful. Because I remember there was a time 
years ago, I remember skipping one D group meeting, and then the following week, I skipped it, and then I realized, wow, I can do other things, and you know, um, you know, maybe I'm okay spiritually. And I, before I realized it, that December, I was already skipping D group for three to four months. I went back to D group around March or April already because I came up with certain excuses that I felt was justified. So just be very careful. It is not God's design for you to spiritually grow alone. Yes, you do your part to grow spiritually, personally, but the people around you, God wants to use to speak into your life. All right? So I'm, I want you to have a proper mindset when you're part of a small group. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask everyone, everyone who is part of a small group, just raise your, just stand up, stand up, everyone. Okay? Don't be shy. Okay? Come on, don't be too comfortable. I've been standing up for a long time already. Okay? So look, stand up, okay? all of you who are part of a small group. Okay? I want to encourage you, be consistent and have this mindset on your way going to the small group, right? In Hebrews, when I go to that small group meeting, I am thinking, how can I be a blessing to the people in my small group? How can I spur and encourage them to love more? How can I encourage my other members to, to love God even more and to do more service to the Lord? How can I encourage my members to make disciples? That's the mindset. Do you understand? Okay, if you haven't understood, please remain standing. No, no, okay? Now, those of you, some of you are seated, okay? We encourage you. We want you to be part of a small group as well because you will experience a lot of blessings and you will grow spiritually. And you know what? There's also a lot of food. But that's not the main reason, correct? Okay, you can sit down. You can sit down, all right? So if you haven't been part, if you're not part of a small group, just go to the Connect Hub and fill out the connection card so we can fill it, so that we can assign you to a group. What's the next? Okay, so again, study the scripture, fellowship in small groups. Third is worship. It's okay, worship. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, again, in the breaking of the bread. What does this mean? Well, first, it's symbolic. It's a phrase. But let me explain it to you a little bit more. When you say breaking of bread, it's, it, it's having meals together. Now, during the olden times, this is very meaningful. When you invite someone for meals together, it means that, you, that it symbolizes unity it symbolizes that you accept one another. You, you, you invite others for a meal. That means you love one another, you accept one another. But this one, it says, to the breaking of the bread. The, the breaking of the bread means it's about the Lord's Supper. Okay? So when they meet, they would have Lord's Supper. And again, during Lord's Supper, during communion, they recall the goodness of the Lord. They recall what Jesus did on the cross. They recall that Jesus had the power to resurrect from the dead. You see? And so what are they doing during the breaking of the bread? They were worshiping God. You see, worshiping God, what is worship anyway? Worship is honoring God for who He is, what He has done, and what He is going to do. Let me repeat that. Worship is honoring God for who He is, what he has done, and what he is going to do. So when you come together, you worship God when you recall who he is. And you know, and I think about it, for me, one of the greatest, I guess, attributes or characteristics of God personally for me, who he is, is that he is a very patient God. Because I sense if God has not been patient with me, Maybe he would have chosen somebody else to serve him. Maybe, you know, I would have received more consequences for my sin. That's really, for me, the most important characteristic that's relevant to me. He is so patient with me. What has he done in my life? He has done so many things. I'm married to the most beautiful girl in the world. Right? In my eyes. Right? And I have big eyes. Okay, and I have beautiful children. You know what? I, I see that. 
And you guys know that, you know, most of you know how we lost the, our house last year because of the, you know, it flooded the whole two floors. And I felt so blessed yeah, that God provided us another house to rent. I feel so blessed that I'm part of a church that loves one another, that encourages one another. It's like if I was not the pastor of this church, I would still want to attend this church because of the people, how they blessed me. You see? And what he's going to do, you know what? God is going to do so much more. I'm excited when I think about the second coming, when I think about all that God wants to do in New Zealand, in the whole of Oceania. I'm excited. And that's why I worship him. Can I encourage you? You worship God wherever. In a large group setting like this, worship God in a small group setting during your D group time. That's why you have praise reports and you share blessings. And you also have a personal time of worship. Sometimes we don't have time for personal worship where it's just you and your God. Can I give you a practical um, application? Make your house a house of worship. Make your house a house of worship. Okay? Sing songs of praises to God. Let your showers be a place of worship. Okay? For me, that's the only place I really sing. Okay? And I sing at the top of my voice. Right? Because there's something about the shower that, you know, the echo, the reverb, you know, all these things. It's, it's like I can join, uh, you know, those idol stuff. Okay? But when the shower turns off, back to reality. Okay? So make your house a house of worship. You sing praises with each other in your family. And then you talk to your children. You ask, what is God? How has God blessed you today? Make your place, your house, a house of worship. Worship God wherever. I also say, worship God how, however and wherever. First is worship God through your lips. Okay? You sing. You talk about His goodness. Because God is good all the time. Okay? Talk about how wonderful He is. And then you worship God through your lifestyle. That is why it's so important that there's accountability. That's why we want to roll out to everyone. Everyone should be accountable to someone. Someone should be attend. You know, you should all be having these um, intentional discipleship sessions. And this, this, this accountability, it requires three main things. It requires humility, consistency, and transparency. You see, if there's no humility, you're not going to change. If there's no consistency, you will not feel you're accountable to anyone. Plus, if there's no transparency and you're not telling your discipler what your sins are, how can your discipler first pray for you and how can your discipler correct you? You see, you need humility, transparency, and consistency if you want a true discipleship relationship. I ask you this question, and maybe you can ask your disciples as well. What are you not obeying? Okay? It's a tough question. But you know what? If we want to live a holy life, be honest with yourself. What are you not obeying today? Ask this question. Is it about forgiveness? Is it about lust? Is it about pornography? Is it about a waste of your time? Is it pride? What are you not obeying today? Okay? So worship God through your lips. Worship God through your lifestyle. And also worship God through your labor your labor for the Lord, your service for the Lord. Your main service for the Lord is making disciples within our family at first, right? So you serve. You serve in the D group. Sometimes you can be the host of your D group setting, bring food, you encourage. That's how you serve the Lord. And serve in the ministries here. And can I just remind you, when you serve the Lord, you focus on God, not on people, don't say that, well, you know what? Others are not serving, so I don't like serving as well. You know what? That's, that's between them and God. But for you, you serve. You cannot go to God and say, well, you know what? The others are not serving, so I, I'm not encouraged to serve as well. You know what? That's between them and God. And you, your attitude, you do not focus on people. You just serve. Or else, if you're looking at people and that's how you respond, then maybe that is pride. Can I encourage you? Worship. Worship God the first thing in the morning. You know what Pastor Bong uh, Saking would tell me? Before he gets up in bed, he worships God 
until he, he senses in his soul that he is in a very happy state, that he is so joyful. Do you, do you, do you know Pastor Bong? Does he look joyful? He's very joyful. Okay? He's always joyful. But you know what he said? I have a habit. Before I get up from my bed, I worship the Lord and make sure that I am in a joyful state before I start standing up. For some of us, when we wake up, eh, niya niya, man. Okay? You know, you know, you, you have already you already have negative thoughts. Oh, work again. Oh no, dress up the kids. Oh no. Okay, laway na naman misis. Okay, you know, all these things. So the idea there is what we have to do is you have to be in a joyful state. Okay, we're gonna talk about that a bit later. But worship God first thing in the morning, right? And then next. Worship God by honoring Him at, at night on your bed. Okay, if you're married, how about this habit? Each of you, husband and wife, share three blessings that you are grateful for for the day. And then you close in prayer just worshiping God. So your spouse shares three things that you can be grateful for for the day. You share three things and then you pray and worship God. Okay, so that's what we do. Now, Worship God also as a family, of course. So we want you to do family devotions every week. All right? So that's worship. Next is, related to this, is prayer. They were also devoted to prayer. Can you imagine? It's an incredible privilege for us to be able to come to God. There was a time during the Old Testament, right? It's only the high priest that can be the holy of holies and approach God. But now the veil is torn and that we can approach God anytime, made possible through Jesus Christ. We don't pray enough. When do you pray? Many times we only pray when there is a crisis, correct? We, in D group, we only pray at the start of D group. Lord, thank you for the food. <laughs> eh? and, Lord, and then you end the D group. Let's close in prayer. Sometimes we just pray before meals, and sometimes we only have rushed prayers while in the car. You know, one of the greatest missionaries ever is named Hudson Taylor. And if it was today, okay, if you understand, you can understand this. There are millions of Christians today in China. But during the time of Hudson Taylor, there were no books, there was no, there was no Google. Okay? He did not know what to expect, but from the things that he would hear, he knew it was hard. All right? But you know what? He still did the mission trip to China several times. Even in his failing health, he would do it. But when I read his uh, like, uh, biography of him, he said there that the sun does not rise in China before I first pray for everyone in the ministry here. What does this mean? Before the sun rises, he has already prayed and woken up and excited to worship the Lord. During the times that he was on a ship and that he would go to China and back and forth, back and forth, in the ships early, uh, early in the morning or late at night, you know what? He would have a candlelight lighting and he would have his quiet time in front of the light because he loves praying to the Lord and reading God's word. We have so many conveniences today that we, don't take, we, that, that we don't take this seriously. We take it for granted. You know what? There's, in the U.S., the ratio of population to Bibles is one is to do. For every one person, there's two Bibles. That's how much Bibles are there. But I don't know how many of the Bibles are being read, right? So we can use our time better, right? And one of the ways is to pray. Now, one of the ways for you to improve your use of time, which I shared to the singles, is for the use of your internet. Okay, let me show you these statistics. Okay, these are the top countries in the world that use internet per day, time spent in the internet per day. The average worldwide is about six hours. In New Zealand, the average is five hours and 55 minutes using the internet. Now, some of you, you know, will say, well, you know what, uh, we use it for work, etc. Yeah, fine. Okay, for the, okay, you know, click, click. Philippines, 10 hours. We are number one in the world 
when it comes to internet use. <laughs> Woo! Okay. Now, we say, well, you know what? That's because of work, etc. Okay. Let's look at the research when it comes to the use of social media. Okay, out of this. Okay, so social media. Okay, average is 2 hours 16 minutes. In New Zealand, we average 1 hour 43, uh, one hour 43 minutes per day in social media. And I'm telling you, it's not because of work. Okay, only 15% use social media for work. All right? And who's number one again? Philippines! Four hours in social media per day. Can you imagine that? And then you say, I do not have time to pray. I do not have time to quiet time. I do not have time to go to the group. I'm so busy, all right? Or I, I, I need to catch up on work or stuff and uh, chores. That's why I could not go to a Sunday service. But the truth is, that's just about social media, okay? Again, number one in the world, okay? Let's, let's try to lower that a bit, right? Can you imagine if we just convert one hour of that for prayer? What if we converted even just one hour of that more to prayer? You see, when it comes to prayer, it cannot be simply based on feelings. You feel fearful, therefore I should pray. I feel, you know, sad, therefore I should pray. I feel I'm lacking, therefore I should pray. Prayer is not based on feelings. We do it because we love the Lord. So I encourage you, come up with a list, okay? So this one will just be quick. Come up with a list. For example, list of what can you praise God for, okay? So just to, to guide you, I listed down a few of God's names that you can praise Him for, okay? So look at this. You can say, Lord, I praise you, are, you are Jehovah Shammah. God is present with me. Therefore, you are here. I am never alone, Lord Jesus, I praise God because you are Jehovah Rohi. God is my shepherd. You lead me and feed me and protect me. Lord Jesus, I praise God that you are Jehovah Jireh. The God, provide, God is my provider. You see what I need before I ask. Next. Lord, I praise that you are Jehovah Rapha. God is my healer. You can heal my body, my emotions, and my relationships. Lord, you are Jehovah Tzigad. Sidkenu, God is my, my righteousness. You accept me and forgive me because of Jesus. You are Jehovah M. Kiddish. God is my sanctification. You make me holy like Jesus. Okay? You are Jehovah Shalom. God is my peace. You give me peace in spite of circumstances. And Lord, you are Jehovah Nisi. God is my banner. You are my victory in conflict and confrontation. You know what? You just have this list of praises. You will have already a lot of things to pray for and worship God for. Amen? But maybe you don't know these names of the Lord. Maybe you haven't experienced Him because you're not reading God's Word. You're not praying. You're not depending on the Lord. Okay? So make a list of things to praise God for. Then also you make a list, a prayer list of your purpose. What does God want you to do for your family, your work, your ministry? List it down. Okay, when it comes to provision, what are the things you want to pray for when it comes to provision? When it comes to pardon, what, does, what is God telling you to ask for forgiveness from? List it down. What are your habitual sins that you need to break? Okay, when it comes to people, there are so many people to pray for. Pray for your D-group leaders. Pray for our council of servants. Pray for me. Because I am also, you know, I'm not perfect. I need your prayers as well. And then you pray for protection. You pray for protection from the evil one. So I encourage you, pray. Pray individually. Pray as a small group. Pray as a spiritual family. What happened because of these habits, these first four habits? Verse 43, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. God was working supernaturally, and there were lives being changed. Right? Those are the first four. Now, let me go through the next. Next that you can see in these verses is generosity. The habit of generosity. All the believers, verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Okay? Now, some people will say, does that sound like communism? Right? The government takes all the properties and distributes it. 
But you know what? This is not communism. The difference is, this was voluntary. It was out of love. In communism, it was forced upon you. This was voluntary, done with a cheerful heart, done with a spiritual family supporting one another. And what were they selling? Property. Okay? Now, how much is property? Let's not talk about Auckland. Okay? But, you know, if it's Auckland, it's really expensive. But what the point here is, it is valuable. But you know what? They shared. They shared. You know, did you notice in CCF we don't pass around offering boxes? Right? Because we want you to do it voluntarily in a cheerful heart. But we will remind you that it is a command of God. Right? To, to tithe. It is a command by God in the Old Testament. And Jesus said, you do, not, uh, you do not miss out on that also. Right? You do not forget the latter. That's what he said in the Bible. But you know what? We don't pass it around because we want you to give it with a cheerful heart. So that's the idea. Right? Now, it says here, everyone who had need. So this is also not abuse. Oh, let's not just work. Let's just wait for Brother Paul to sell his house so that he, we can receive. You know, that's, not, that's abuse. Do you understand? That's not what this means. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Okay? You don't simply provide to anyone. Maybe God's teaching them something. And it has to be a legitimate deed. And also, by the way, we do not promote borrowing of money in D groups. Do you know that? Okay, so we're careful with that. In a small group, you get the support, not just physical, okay, but also the emotional and the spiritual. Okay, so I shared with you recently, uh, well, you heard about recently what happened to the son, uh, the, sorry, the daughter of Pastor Peter, right, Joy, where he, when she gave birth, suddenly there were some complications, they found a cyst, etc., and she's now doing well right now. Okay, but What's great here is how she experienced the generosity, the love, the prayers of a small group in a spiritual family. So I'm going to uh, show this video so that you can have that sense what a spiritual family should really be. Okay, so let's show this video. You know, last December, and I think my husband shared this as well as my dad, that I'd given birth to our sixth child. And everything was normal at the beginning and easy. Uh, but a few days after I gave birth, I experienced excruciating pain, and I didn't know what was wrong. About a month later, uh, Christmas Eve, we found out I had a, a 13 cm cyst in my uterus, and it had to be removed immediately. So I was operated on December 26, and it was supposed to be an easy surgery, maybe two to three hours, but then it became very complicated. It extended to eight hours, and, and they had to remove my my ovaries, my uterus, my cervix, my appendix, and part of my intestines had to be cut, uh, removed, and reconnected. Um, and then they had to take out the cyst, which had a 1.7 liters of pus and blood. And so, you know, it's really God's grace that I survived that surgery, but afterwards, I really struggled in my faith. I knew that I, of course, I knew that God is good, that He loves me. But a part of me was like, why, why did it have to be like this, you know? And of, of course, I knew He still had a plan for me. Um, but I did struggle. I, I, I struggled to understand how to define and understand God's love. I praise God that my husband was there for me. He was very supportive. Of course, I really read God's Word for encouragement. But it was very interesting because when I went through surgery, my entire family was in the U.S. Uh, we were all supposed to go on this vacation together. And God so designed it that they were away. And normally they would be my, my spiritual support uh, apart from Edric. And so it was interesting that they were gone. I think God really intended it because what happened was he used our D group to really demonstrate to us that he was present and that he really loved us. One of the things that I really struggled with as, as a mom um, was I really wanted to breastfeed my baby, but the doctor said, you will not be able to breastfeed her for several weeks because of the surgery, all the antibiotics you are on. And so I was like, Lord, I, 
I'm a breastfeeding advocate. How do I make sure that my baby gets breast milk? And my D group, one of them was still breastfeeding, and she said, I will give you milk. I will donate my milk. And other people who didn't, who were not breastfeeding, they found suppliers for me. So my baby became really fat. <laughs> she looks like a shopao. <laughs> You know, God is amazing, and normally my milk is like skim milk, but this milk that was donated is like full cream, so my baby became really healthy. It really is amazing. And then I remember the night that we were discharged, it was, it was New Year's Eve, and we were thinking, how are we going to bring all our stuff home from the hospital because our driver was not available? And our, one of our D group, they came and they said, you know, we will bring your things home for you so that when you check out, it'll be very easy. So it was just little things like this. And, a nut, and then that same night, we were going to go home, and there was nobody to cook in the house. And I was like, Lord, I can't, I can't cook in the state I'm in. I, I'm too weak and, and not well. And one of um, the D group members of my mom's D group, she sent over a feast, like all this Chinese food for us to eat. So when we got home, it was our first meal together as a family since I'd been hospitalized. And there was so much food. And it was just the timing of it. God used um, that D group member to show us that he was really thinking about us. And then so many women offered to give me lapu-lapu soup. If my dad had been here, he would have eaten it. <laughs> but just they said, you know, to help you heal. It was so special. And then some of them, they came over to my house and they said, we're going to cook we're going to cook for you so that we can store all this food that you'll have in your freezer so that every time you need to eat, you can just, you know, defrost it because I was having digestive problems. So everything I ate, it would just come out and um, I was really losing a lot of weight. So they helped me by just coming over to cook for me. And then some people from my dad's D group also, they came over to visit us in the hospital and just to be with us, to pray with us. And, and one of them from his extended D group family gave us a significant amount of money. And it was such a surprise and we were so embarrassed to accept it. But it was really perfect timing also because the expenses did pile up. I had so many doctors that we had to pay for. So these were some of the ways that God showed us through the D group family that he was mindful of us. And when I was struggling with, Lord, you know, I know you love me, but it hurts. It hurts to know that as a father, you allowed this to happen. Um, but he showed us, you know, I'm still thinking of you. And through my other children, the D group family, you're going to experience my love. And Edric and I, I was sharing this with my family. I said, you know, we've always been on the, more on the ministering side of things, where we're the ones giving to people and serving people. I think this was the, one of the first times in a very long time that I really felt um, like what it really meant to be part of a, a greater spiritual family in Christ and to have a spiritual family that looks out for you and cares for you. And that's really God's design for all of us, that we would be connected to a small group where we experience what it means to be part of his family, because that's how we can really love each other. By God's grace, I'm going on uh, my seventh week already, post-operation. The doctor has allowed me to be out. So praise God. I can, I'm much stronger now, and I can breastfeed my baby also. So he continues to heal me every day, and I want to thank you all for many of you were praying for our family, and I really felt God's love also through those prayers. So I praise God, and I pray that we all experience what it means to be part of God's family by also being connected to a smaller group where we can grow in our love for God and for one another. To God be the glory. Yeah, I want you to imagine what if all of us we're that loving and generous to one another. You know what? It's, the world is going to take notice. What's in that church? Why is it that they are that way? They're loving one another. And we can say it's because of Jesus Christ. And it's because the love of God is just flowing through us. You know, another is, yeah, as we go through the next habit, there has to be a habit of joyfulness in our church. Joyfulness. Everyone say joyfulness. 
Every day, they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. So there was so much joy and unity amongst the believers, even if they met every day. Okay, think about it. Some people, you know, I can take this person if I meet this person once a week, you know, but if, this per- if I see this person every day, you start irritating each other. Yeah? No, that should not be, Right? There has to be so much love even if they meet, right? So I ask you, when you meet in a D-group and on Sundays, are there glad and sincere hearts? Are you glad to be here today? Thank you. Are you glad to be here today? Are you glad to be here today? Well, I'm glad to be here today, all right? So that's the idea, and you have to be glad. But I ask you, is there any kind of irritation in your D-group? Is there any pride or unforgiveness elsewhere? You've got to resolve those issues amongst the D-group. You cannot just wish that it gets fixed. you got to approach it. you got to talk to the people involved. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 to 3, it says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So verse, tells, verse 2 tells us, how should you be? You should be humble. You should be patient. You should bear one another in love. That's who you should be. And then, what do you need to do? You need to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. You don't just wish problems go away. You talk to your D-group leader, your D12 leader. Do all you can to make sure that there is joy in your D-group. Right? So, do you understand so far? Thank you. Okay. And I pray also that there will be joy in your heart even in the midst of trials or pain. Because many times we have joy when things are going our way, when we are blessed, when we get that promotion, you know, when all of us are healthy. But the idea here is there should be joy even in the midst of unfavorable circumstances. Because that is where true Christ followers will shine into this world and attract the people to Christ. In Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crops fail, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will be joyful in God, my Savior. You see, this is about life or death. But even in a life or death situation that they have nothing anymore, they've lost everything, cattle, sheep, etc., they, that person can say, I will still rejoice in the Lord. Is there anything stealing your joy today? Is there anything stealing your joy today? Then you know what? Do something about it. Get counsel from your D group leader and make sure that that thing, that person does not steal your joy today. And if you know someone, if you know a D group member that seems to have lost their joy, then why don't you approach it and do something about it? Okay? So, last portion of Acts chapter 2, in verse 47, it talks about another habit, and that is witnessing. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Can you imagine? This is daily. It's not every week. Daily, it was, their number was being added because they were filled by the Holy Spirit. And how did they witness? Of course, they preached God's Word and they practiced God's Word. When I say preached God's Word, they talked about Jesus. Remember the breaking of the bread? They're talking about Jesus everywhere, about the resurrection, about His goodness and His power. They're encouraging one another every day. You see, that's the problem when we have this online streaming kind of services. You start to think, well, you know what? I attended the service anyway, so I already listened to the message. That's consumerism. What can I get out of it? But the idea is, the reason why we gather together, it's not just what I can get out of it. You're thinking about, how can I be a blessing? Even that short conversation before the service or after the service, how can I be a blessing to the people who attended? And you cannot do that uh, uh, online, right? So I'm not saying that online is bad, 
right? Many people in CCF has got saved and got introduced to Jesus through our online ministry. But you cannot, you know, you cannot just depend on online. You have to have face-to-face -face meetings with people. Large group setting, small group setting. And then, of course, they practiced God's Word. So they preached God's Word, click, and they practiced God's Word. I ask you, does the way you live your life attract people to Christ? Right? Does it attract people to Christ? What's our favorite verse in CCF? Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. Let's all read this together. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You know what? They, pra they preached it and they practiced it. Eventually, at the first, it didn't. They didn't. And eventually, they did. And what I want you to focus on is they're teaching them to obey. Not teaching them to know the scriptures. It's teaching them to obey. There's one thing to know. Yeah, I know adultery is wrong. Yeah, I know bitterness is wrong. Yeah, I know unforgiveness is wrong. Yeah, I know lust is wrong. But are you obeying? We are teaching you to obey. Not simply to know. Again, I ask you this question. What are you not obeying today? Right? I ask you, are you not obeying this command of making disciples? I challenge you. Ask yourself also, who will you start discipling? So as I close, what's the title of our message? Practice the habits of a spirit-filled church. You cannot do this on your own. You need the Holy Spirit to do this. Habits mean it's done consistently, it's a priority, and it's intentional. So what are the seven habits? First is study of scripture, fellowship in small groups, worship, prayer, generosity, joyfulness, and witnessing. From these seven, what do you need to immediately do? What do you need to immediately put into your life? What habit? Maybe all of it, but what? where do you start, right? I don't know if you recall, but I gave you this quote a few weeks ago. To start the Christian life right, God provides you with Jesus Christ. To finish the Christian life well, God provides you with the Holy Spirit. When you have this habit of doing all this, God will use you. And you cannot help doing it even if, you know, time is short or the circumstances are not good. Let me close by sharing you the story. Last January, my wife and I and a few others from our church went to IDC in the Philippines, right? You know about that, the Intentional Discipleship Conference. We have one CCF pastor from a Middle East, from a Middle East satellite. He was already in the airport going to the Philippines for IDC. But in the airport, officials came to him and detained him and put him in prison. This is one of our pastors, right? And the, 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 there were, there were, they brought up charges on him about a case that was already closed years ago. So he was locked up in prison for a couple of days. But you know what? This pastor of ours in this Middle Eastern country is a spirit-filled man. He prayed in jail. And you know what? Because of his habits, guess what he did in jail? He started a day group. <laughs> Complete attendance. No late. Okay? Complete. He prayed in jail, started a day group. He talked to 19 people in jail, mostly Muslims, and would ask, how can I pray for you? Pray, care, and share. And during that time, he read the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Because he had all the time in the world. So if you want to have time in the world, uh, Brother Rene, who can we contact so that they can be put in prison? Okay? You see? But you know what? He prayed for these people. He shared. He testified. There was one Filipino in that jail who converted to Muslim. And that Filipino told our pastor, pray to Allah and your sentence will be cut in half. The pastor said, no, my Jesus, my God is more powerful. 
And you know what? While they were talking, someone, the jail warden, called his name. I won't mention the name. Okay? And he said, you can leave now. Your case is dismissed. You see? You want to praise God for that? Yes. When he had, you know, and I praise God, he was able to go to IDC and also to our, our retreat. Um, but this guy, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. He will pray. He will worship. He will witness. He will do all these things because it's already a habit. Okay? Bad habits are hard to break. But good habits are hard to break too. So develop these good habits so that when times are tough, you will still be doing it just like our pastor from Middle East. And God will be glorified through your life. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you, O God. And Lord, we know that there are habits that we need to develop in our life. And Lord, from the seven that was discussed here, can you please tell us, Lord, which one we need to focus on? Forgive us for the times you've, we've taken you for granted. Forgive us for the times that we were complacent. But now, Lord, we repent for taking you for granted, O oh God. So, Lord Jesus, we come before you, O oh God. We worship you today. We pray that you change our hearts, our motives, and our priorities so that when people look at our lives, they don't have to second guess. It is pretty clear who our God is. It is pretty clear who we follow. It is pretty clear who our priority is, and that is you, simply by them observing our lives. Oh Lord, guide us and strengthen us. And Lord, I pray, Lord, right now for some people here who might not have really surrendered their lives to you. If that is you, remember the resurrection demands a choice. And if you want to make that choice to fully surrender your life to Christ, don't delay it. Let today be the day. If you want to surrender your life to Christ, pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I acknowledge that I have strayed away. I have not prioritized you. I have not thought much about you. But now I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all my sins. I repent of all my sins. I now open my life to you. I surrender my life to you. I make you my Savior and Lord. Beginning today, you are my God. You are my Savior. You are my Jesus whom I will follow for the rest of my days. And Lord, Father God, make me into the kind of person that honors you, that glorifies you, and that attracts people to you. Thank you, Lord Father, and I pray for everyone here that we will live such spirit-filled lives that you are so blessed and we will live a supernatural life that attracts people to Jesus. To you be all the glory, honor, and praise for we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.